I mentioned a moment ago that this is Heritage Week as a reminder of our heritage, and I believe that you would agree with me that it's impossible to really talk about heritage without talking about people. And uh, so it's a privilege for me to just, as it were, bring to attention the lives of very significant patriarchs to our ministry in this very uh, fitting pictorial representation of our two founding couples. Uh, the testimony of the Appalachian Bible College or Appalachian Bible Institute, as it was first known, was uh, a, a desired burden of a pastor at Pettus Baptist Church, Pettus, West Virginia, named Bob Gulick, his wife Nan. Uh, you see them noted there in the photo. And uh, they had a heart that wanted to try and nurture their young people to train to serve God or to know God. It felt like likely they would not get a chance if they didn't bring it to them. And so through a prior acquaintance and friendship, with uh, Lester Pipkin and Gretchen Pipkin. Uh, they made contact with that couple. Uh, the Pipkins were serving in pastoral ministry in Minnesota at the time. And from that location, they found themselves corresponding about how this might work and what God might have in mind. And with very diligent uh, faith and trust in God's provision and with a sense of sacrifice that none of us in this room can fully appreciate, uh, they ventured off on that journey which we now experience these years later. Uh, I might, might say that uh, uh, my occasion of acquaintance with both of these men was a blessing. One of my memories especially was an occasion when the passing of the first board member, Johnny Price, happened years ago, and, and uh, both of these men were still living, uh, Bob Gulick and Lester Pipkin, and, and uh, I was honored to share that grave service in Whitesville, West Virginia, where Johnny Price had been a, just a godly businessman in the community. And uh, his contribution of beginning to the school start was just very, very significant. And I remember standing by that graveside for Johnny Price now decades later and standing in the presence of Bob Gulick and Lester Pipkin and feeling like I was in a, in a bit of a time warp with history and recognizing the significance of these servants of the Lord who had courageously stepped out by faith to begin a fledgling institution in the most unlikely place you could imagine with very, very modest beginnings. Uh, the stories of their uh, commitment to the task are, are many. Uh, Pastor Gulick eventually moves to another church and pastoring, and so his role in the college was minimal from that point. But uh, I have, through the years, had occasion of many uh, stories and illustrations through my friendship with Dr. Pipkin, uh, sharing things that are pretty touching if you really think about it. If you knew him, you could really relate to it. Uh, I remember him talking about, for example, just finding himself so overwhelmed with the task of serving. And at that time, they were living in the little house here at the entrance, the farmhouse on campus. And he said, I found myself so burdened with this experiment uh, having moved to this new campus and struggling with just finances and challenges of beginnings. And he said, I found myself lying literally prostrate on the, on, the, on the floor of our living room, crying out to God, oh God, deliver me from this, with a sense of just absolute, just a, uh, you know, overwhelming burden with it. Another occasion that I remember him sharing was that in the modesty of their ability to have resources, he found himself with the you know, the concern of having um, holes in the bottom of his shoes, which were literally not just evidences of the first layer of his soul wearing off, but literally all the way through the, the shoe and, and not being able to buy shoes. And this is not a, an attempt of exaggeration. He said, I, I cut cardboard and put in the bottom of my shoes so I could still wear my shoes without having my feet literally rub on the ground as I was walking. Or one of my favorite stories is an occasion when in the days of his travels to Charleston on the turnpike, used to be such that you got on the turnpike uh, wherever you got on. And so here in Beckley, and they would give you a ticket as you got on. And then when you got off of whatever destination, you would then pay the amount that was on that ticket at that particular juncture of exit. And uh, he said, on that day, as I was scheduled to preach in Charleston on a Sunday, I had no money whatsoever. I got on the turnpike knowing I had no money picked up my ticket, got to the exit at the Charleston exit, and he said to the attendant at the, at the booth, he said, I don't have any money to pay my ticket. I'm going to be preaching today. They'll pay me for my preaching. I'm going to leave my watch 
written as sort of deposit. And so I'll pick up my watch tonight when I come home and I'll give you the money for my ticket that I pay this morning so that that way you'll have my watch as sort of the deposit. And uh, as that story was shared by Dr. Pipkin different times, most of us in the audience sort of laughed because he never used a watch anyway. He preached as long as you could imagine. You cannot ever imagine a longer preacher than Dr. Pipkin. And so you think sometimes I get a little windy. You haven't even been in a storm yet. And so I just want you to know, great heritage, a man of God who had the courage to just exercise all kinds of creativity. And the, the accounts could go on. Their wives, such dedicated ladies who, who sacrificed and, and supported in ways that are just unimaginable. We have a wonderful, wonderful heritage. And this verse of Scripture I cited from Psalm 16:6, I think is just a, a summary statement I have a goodly heritage. Would you say that phrase with me? I have a goodly heritage. We sit here in comfort. We sit here with convenience. And while you may owe on your school bill and you may have some challenges that you're facing today, may I just say that we sit here blessed with those who went before us with a sense of dedication that made our time today possible. We have a goodly heritage. You know, that's a testimony that I think is fitting. We're not worshiping people. We're not just exalting uh, an individual and, and raising them up with a sense of superiority. We want to honor their faith and their testimony for God. And that's found throughout the pages of Scripture. I'm going to give you today what I consider to be a great example of a, an honoring of heritage in the Scriptures. Turn to Second Chronicles chapter 34, if you would, please. 2 Chronicles chapter 34, as you're turning there, this portion of Scripture records for us the occasion of the last good king of the nation of Israel in their entire history. I'm, I know it was Judah, but this was the last good king that Israel ever had. They won't have another good king till Jesus comes, and they'll have a good king. But here's the last king. We know his account probably from maybe even some Sunday school stories because it's about a, a, a young child, eight years of age, Josiah. But uh, I want you to just reflect in this particular occasion as he rules during 640 to 608 B.C. And, and brings about this sort of concluding time of spiritual vibrancy in the land before they then move into the decadence of the Babylonian captivity and then the continued decadence that they have in terms of without being a king even to this day. But as you look at this chapter, we're not going to go through the entirety of it, but I, I'd like to highlight some things. The reason I select this chapter is because Josiah had a sense of heritage. Look at verse 2 of chapter 34, if you would, please. This boy, eight years of age, reigns in Jerusalem 31 years, but it says this, he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of David, his father. Now, he's generations removed from David, centuries removed from David. But yet his identity of heritage is still reflected upon that which was a godly good example, David. And his identity in this verse of Scripture by the writers of Scripture were placing his spiritual testimony, his reference of honor to the heritage of the land back to a godly king, David. Not a perfect king, but a godly king, a man after God's own heart. And so today as we even think of our heritage, I would never exalt the Gulicks or the Pipkins as perfect or persons that were without their own failures and flaws. The truth is that was never their desire to even a, 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 a assume that. But they were godly people who, who had a testimony of faith and we have a great heritage. And with honor to that heritage, I'd like to just highlight how Josiah unfolds his testimony very briefly before we look at a portion with great detail. But would you just trace with me real quickly the references to his developing heritage? And I will say this to you as students. You have the opportunity at your stage to have heritage honor. Staff, you do at your stage, no matter what stage, whether you're a recent staff or a long-serving staff, every person in the, and the testimony of Josiah reflects that. And I often think of the heritage testimony that we have as one that you, you love that which God's given to you. You ought to love ABC, not because I'm here or because we're trying to promote a school, but you ought to love what God gives you here. You ought to be loyal to what's here. That's part of a heritage. Be loyal to this place, not because it's flawless. You're here, so it's not flawless. How's that for bluntness, huh? But it's a wonderful privilege to be loyal. And then to lead others to that same kind of identity. 
our passion for this that we're doing even tonight is not related to some kind of a cheap, superficial promotion. It's because what we do here, our world needs desperately. And so with that sense, we see this tracing of Josiah's heritage. Just highlight it with me briefly. Verse 1, he's eight years of age. King at eight. Wow, that's a big assignment. It's largely related to the pattern of the day. He selected after his godless predecessors were removed, and he steps on the scene. We don't know his testimony of how he became so godly. may have had a, a nanny that took care of him. Don't know the resources that guided him, but we find that he's a king at eight. He's seeking God at 16, verse 3 says. In his eighth year, when he's 16 years of age, he has a passionate heart for God. I thought, what a fitting comparison. Not quite the same age as you as students, but do you have a heart that really seeks God? Do you really pant after God? Is it the passion of your day to know God? Here's Josiah, 16, described as seeking the Lord after the Lord. And then at, at age 20, the same verse, look at verse 3. It says that he began at that point after he was following in the ways of his father David to purge Judah and Jerusalem. He begins to address the sin of the day with boldness, courage, destroying the idols, correcting the sins of the times. What a great litany of his life as it develops at age 20. And then we move down to verse 8 where we see he's described at, at uh, age 26. He's going to find himself, as it were, repairing the house of God, the work of God. And very intentionally, this center of their attention of God in their, in their worship system, the temple. And he begins that process at age 26 in verse 8 and moves on down through that to the point of, of repairing the house of the Lord and, and eventually finds the book of God, verse 14, and his heritage of returning to the Scriptures. And as they find this book, it's, a, it's an embarrassment to think that, that that has been there the whole time and they've never seen it. But by the way, a Bible is around us all the time and most of us are guilty of not using it as we should. What a reminder of Josiah's heritage. And uh, this particular testimony goes on in verse 21 to say that he finds himself as he hears the book of God, wanting to inquire, what does God want of me? Could that be said of every one of us in this room, everyone in the audience of my voice today? Do you really inquire, what does God want from me? That's honoring our heritage spiritually. And so in verse 21, he says, go, inquire the Lord. What, what should we do? And that brings us to this character of Huldah, a prophetess, a lady who was a godly leader at that time. And I say this in passing. You know, Gretchen Pipkin and Nan Gulick were godly ladies who set the tone of our campus and our community in ways that we still enjoy to this day. And I praise God for the impact of ladies that have been a part of our heritage. And you that are ladies in this audience, would you rise up and be Huldah's in your generation, knowing the Word of God and adhering to the Word of God and exhorting others in the Word of God. We desperately need that. I trust that you'll find your heart determined to follow that example. And with a sense of then abbreviation, I want to begin in verse 27 of this passage. And through the end of the chapter, I'd like you to note with me three parts of a testimony of an example of honoring heritage. Three parts of a testimony of an heritage that is honored. Verse 27, would you follow as I read through the end of the chapter? Because thine heart was tender, and thou didst humble thyself, referring to Josiah, as the message was given through the, the leadership of Huldah here. Because thine heart was tender, and thou didst humble thyself before God, when thou heardest his words against this place and, and against its inhabitants, and humblest thyself before me, and didst tear thy clothes and weep before me, I have even heard thee also, saith the Lord. Behold, I will gather thee to thy fathers, and thou shalt be gathered to thy grave in peace." Neither shall thine eyes see all the evil that I will bring upon this place and upon the inhabitants of the same. So they brought the king word again. Then the king sent and gathered together all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. The king went up into the house of the Lord and all the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the priests and the Levites and all the people, great and small, literally children and teenagers, and he read, their, and read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant that was found in the house of the Lord. 
And the king stood in his place and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord, to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and with all his soul to perform the words of the covenant which are written in this book. And he caused all who were present in Jerusalem and Benjamin to stand to it. And the inhabitants of Jerusalem did according to the covenant of God, the God of their fathers, their heritage, if you will. Josiah took away all the abominations out of the countries that pertain to the children of Israel and made all who were present in Israel to serve, even to serve the Lord their God. And all his days they departed not from following the Lord, the God of their fathers. What an amazing tribute, a testimony, an example of someone honoring the heritage that they had received. Would you just note these three particular parts to this testimony. First, we start with the attributes of this example. The attributes of this example are given in verse 27. Quickly highlight these with me from verse 27. First of all, attribute number one is he has a responsive heart. A responsive heart. Please pay attention as you think of this as this moment. What a blessing to have a heart that's tender to God. A responsive heart, it says, because your heart was tender. He had a reverent heart. He was humble before God. He was the king, but he was not arrogant about it. He had a sense of reverence for God. He had a repentant heart. Says that when he heard the book of the law of God and sensed the message of God of what they were supposed to be doing, knew they weren't doing it, he dealt with it with a sense of repentance that was described by these terms of abandonment to his own comforts. Tearing his clothes was not some kind of fit of rage. It was a testimony that the garment I'm wearing is interfering with my testimony of purity and, and godliness to you. And in Jewish tradition, that tearing of the garments, the weeping, he was a repentant heart. But he also was a, requ a requesting heart. He prayed. Look at the end of verse 27. The testimony was, I've heard your prayer. I've heard your prayer. You know, when we have our times of prayer on Tuesday morning, I hope you realize that that's not the only time you can pray. And I know there are circumstances that prevent some persons from being there. But I want to just ask you to ask this question. Am I not there because I have legitimate reason? Or is it because it's just not convenient to me? This is not a judgment or an accusation or measure of your spirituality. It's just a good time to reflect. How do we honor heritage? I can tell you, prayer day on Wednesday is designed to be a part of this week because prayer has been the source of power and continuance for this ministry for all of these years. It is indeed what we need. That's the example of Josiah, the attributes we see. But then would you note the fact that all of this is related to his heart. It's his heart. It's not going through the motions. It's not just having superficial compliance. It was his heart. It's the essence of what he was. Oh, God, give us a heart like this as we go about honoring our heritage today. But then we see second part of this testimony is the assurance of this example. The assurance that was given in verse 28. And by the way, honoring our heritage is not a punishment nor is it a loss it is a blessing. It is an opportunity for us to enjoy in our generation what those before us had established. And here was the promise of assurance given in verse 28. Behold, I will gather thee to thy fathers. Simply put, Josiah, someday you'll die. He would die. He said, thou shalt be gathered to thy grave in peace, if you will. Uh, one of the assurances was a peaceful conclusion or end to his life. I want to say without any concern for failing to be honest that following God does not remove struggles from our lives. You will face turmoil and strife. But you know, in the midst of following God, when you face trials, the words of the psalmist can be yours. It is good for me that I have been afflicted that I might learn thy precepts. You see, you'll still find yourself with a heart of peace in the midst of turmoil when you're following the path that God has given for you. And I truly believe that the things that stretch us are the things that develop us and mature us. I like Warren Wiersbe's comment, the bumps are the things you climb on. We all know our climber's wall down in Gilmore Center. That would be an impossible surface to ascend up without those bumps. And as they stretch and reach and adjust them in ways that are sometimes a little difficult to manage, can I tell you the bumps are the things you climb on. 
And God help us as a campus family to take the difficulties that you might be facing right now, personally, academically, financially, health-wise. Take those bumps and climb on those rather than avoid the fact of those circumstances seeming to make life unpleasant for you. And so here's the promise of a peaceful end. But assurance number two is verse 28. Neither shall thine eyes see all the evil that I will bring upon this place. If you will, the assurance of protected eyes. Protected eyes. Uh, my wife and I often comment these days as we have occasion to maybe watching news or see something that is so alarming with reference to the deterioration of our world and culture. And more than once we've said, boy, we're sure glad our parents aren't living today. They would absolutely just be distraught beyond measure. And I'd like to believe I'm distraught. But that was a generation that the thought of some of the things that are occurring today. And by the way, can I say to you as current students especially, there is the danger of getting used to sin. We can get accustomed to that which is around us and say, well, that's just the way it is these days. And, and more or less not be impacted by it. I think that the closer you get to God the more you find sin so distasteful and disdaining that you just find yourself appalled at the wickedness of the world around you. Not because you're a a grouchy old person, but because holiness and, and, and wickedness just don't go together. And in a world that is increasingly deteriorating, more than ever we need the light of God's Word and the, and the, and the testimony of God's name in the midst of our culture. I trust that you'll find your heart determined by the grace of God to find yourself with this kind of testimony that Josiah had, the assurance of his example. But that leads us to the third part, and finally, and that's the accomplishments that come. It's worth it. The accomplishments that we see in verse 33 are these. As a result of this, really 29 to verse 33, I really think that's a, my, my mistake on that uh, pilot, so it should be, uh, should be 29 to 33 as far as that verse, if you're putting that in your notes, the accomplishments of this example. Look at verse 29. It says, Then the king sent and gathered together all the elders of Israel, And the king went up and all the men, women, and they read the words of the book of the law. There it is, verse 30. What's the first accomplishment? He read the Bible. He read the Bible. I know it sounds so insultingly obvious, but can I tell you what this world needs more than anything else is to read the Bible. The fact is, it might be what you need. I know that you're in an institution of higher learning, so you're constantly assigned readings and books and assignments for papers, and so you read books a lot, and you uh, maybe you're on the uh, web and all kinds of research. Can I just tell you, here's a little rule you ought to follow. Spend as much time reading the Bible as you spend reading all kinds of other stuff. That's a good formula for life. That's a good formula. That'll protect you from getting wrapped up in somebody else's writings instead of God's writings. Read the Bible. Read the Bible. That's what Josiah did as we see this. He read the Bible, verse 30. Not only that, he also required the Bible, verse 31. They made a covenant. This is a promised relationship. They made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord, to keep his commandments, his testimonies, his statutes with all their heart, with all his soul, perform all the words of the covenant written in the book. You know, it's one thing to know the Bible. It's another thing to practice the Bible. Do you find the Bible as the required guideline for your life and and in the practice of your life? He required the Bible, accomplishment number two. But then accomplishment number three was he respected the Bible. Verse 32, I take this with a measure of honor. He caused all who were present in Jerusalem and Benjamin to stand. Would you everybody stand, please? Stand right now. Some of you need to stand to wake up. I mean that sincerely and tragically. Attention to God's Word is what we're doing here. Just imagine, everybody was standing with attention. Your Bible in hand, should have a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, shame on you. Your Bible in hand, the text before you, this is not rebuking you. It's just showing an honor to heritage. If your thought of this did not matter as a chapel today, to say, I need my Bible because we're going to go hear the Word of God. Oh, God, forgive us for being so careless about the significance of the Bible. It's the Bible. It's the Bible. And our heritage is rooted in the Word of God. It was not coincidental that it was Appalachian Bible Institute. 
It's the Bible. So with that sense of passion, he had the focus. They heard the Word of God. And by the way, they didn't have the privilege of of a copy in their hands. They didn't have that luxury. We have it so easily that we take it for granted. We dismiss it with a sense of familiarity. Oh, God, spare us. It's the Bible. It's the Bible. I'm not a one-track message right now, but I want us to know it's the Bible that matters. With a sense of fervency, Josiah had the people stand and said, in honor and respect to the Word of God, it's the Bible. And so with that sense of response, exalting the Bible, remain standing and we see the exercise of that Verse 33, how is it going to play out? By the way, the copy of the Scriptures, that scroll I put there is an emphasis upon the Word of God. But now this exercise accomplishment, verse 33, look at your Bibles. Josiah took away all the abominations out of the countries. I don't know what abominations would be today. I mean this without being too, you know, grouchy or, you know, coy. You know, abominations might be smartphones, (laughs) Might be some, you know, computer program. Might be some, you know, game that you're constantly consumed with. Uh, I'm not here to try and, you know, just dismiss life. But can I just say with all loving candor, we have all kinds of things around us that distract us from the Word of God. And we need to stop and say, should I destroy those? With a loving candor for God's blessing upon this place, may I just say, Oh, God, help us to, number one, exercise the Bible by severing from sin, whatever that might be. He took and he destroyed those things. Not only did he sever from sin, but he then activated service for God. Service for God. You know, serving God is something you can do in the flesh in the sense you go through the motions. I can stand here and preach and be exalting my own identity and trying to promote myself. You know, we can sing, we can lead singing, we can play, we can do all kinds of things, and and it looks like service to God. But only, only God knows if we're truly serving Him. We have this wonderful motto, which I really believe is a great testimony of our ministry in this Heritage Week, because life is for service. That is what service, or that is what life is about, is serving God. I wonder, do you find yourself with a passion to serve God as you think of the Word of God, exercising the Bible through service? He said, all present in Israel were going to serve Him, verse 33, even to serve the Lord their God. And then if I can say this, all His days they departed not from following the Lord. How did He exercise the Bible? Severance from sin service to God, and then sustaining that heritage that he had received. We have a stewardship as a campus family, not to maintain the existence of a college, but to maintain the existence of a cause. That's our heritage. The cause for which this place, we sang our school song a moment ago and I was sort of aware at the beginning of it. We've not sung it probably as often as we should have in the sense that some of you probably weren't as too familiar. You got better as we went through the stanzas. But that song is based upon our school verse, John 4, 36. He that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. Sowing, reaping, gathering fruit together will rejoice. What a heritage to be able to have the privilege of sustaining not a place, but a person, Jesus Christ. And so I trust you'll find yourself with that sense of, I have a goodly heritage. I ask this question. So how do we honor our heritage? How do we honor our heritage? I've made some allusion to it through the message, but the, 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 the bit of clip art that I included would be my summary for you. First of all, we honor our heritage with our hearts. Do we have a heart that pants after God? Do we have a heart that pants after God? We honor our heritage by exalting the Scriptures. This scroll representation of of Josiah's day, 
your, your Bible that you have in your hand, an illustration of how we truly honor our heritage. It says we truly have hearts that pant after God and that are truly committed and passionate to His work. What a rich heritage. I have a goodly heritage. You have a goodly heritage. Today as we close, I'd like to just ask you to join me in pledging your heart to that heritage with the singing of a chorus of a song that is not entirely in our hymn books, but it is a song that is familiar. And would you just note the words on the screen, find us faithful, find us faithful. It's a chorus that I think is designed to just remind us of a previous heritage that has come before us. And then the words enter in, oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. I hope that's your prayer today. I hope that you want wherever you go that persons could follow you and they'd be following God. You know, Paul could say without reservation, be ye followers of me as I am of Christ. He commanded in his very first writing in the New Testament, 1 Thessalonians, that church at Thessalonica said, you became followers of us and of the Lord. You see, our privilege is to live so people could follow us and be following God. And so I hope that the words of this little chorus will be a reminder to do that and make it your prayer as we sing together. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. Join as we sing together these words as our pledge to the Lord in honoring our heritage. Together, please.